Story 1. The Horrors of Mason Manor We loaded into Austin's truck, excited for filming our first paranormal video for our new YouTube channel. My brother Nick and I were horror junkies, and we've always have been, but that wasn't the only reason I was excited. I invited Stacy to come tag along as a joke, but surprisingly enough, she took me up on the offer. She was my crush since third grade, but we slowly had become good friends over the years. I could watch any horror movie in a dark and empty basement, but asking out a girl terrified me. The ride situation required that me and my friends drove up in one vehicle, and Stacy and her friend drove up in another. Mason Manor was a mansion built on the East Mountain where an oil tycoon millionaire brutally killed his family, or that's how the story went. Mr. Mason was never found. This was 30 years ago, but many people speculate that he owed money to the mob or some secret government agency. But there was also another theory. The theory was that it was the spirit of the forest that surrounded the mansion that caused Mr. Mason to do what he did. It's hard to tell, especially with little evidence leading in either direction, and it being so long ago. Regardless of the case's rumors, many people think and have investigated the paranormal aspect that surrounds the home. If I could capture any proof of spirits or evidence that could lead in a break in the case, my YouTube channel will explode overnight. Thankfully, the manor was no longer protected by security and was even left practically wide open for anyone to enter. The caveat to this, however, was that the mansion was out in the middle of the woods and that if you entered the estate at night, the legend had it that you would soon become Mr. Mason's next victim. For our first video to go viral, it was a no-brainer that we had to enter at night. Austin drove the way up the long, twisted road that seemed to no longer be managed up the mountain and into the woods. I got a text from Stacy saying that she and her friend Bridget had arrived at the mansion way earlier than previously agreed on. It was seven o'clock now, and we had another half hour drive before me and my friends would get there. The cool evening air became more brisk the further up we drove. Small flakes of snow began to get bigger. I was a little bit frustrated that she had gotten there before us. Not that it was a big deal or anything, but I was afraid that by the time we got there, that they would want to leave. Nick checked his camera that he had recently purchased online. A few hundred dollars was a small price to pay for internet fame. There was no doubt that this place was full of mystery and foul spirits roaming the halls. The three of us continued the drive until we finally reached the entrance to the estate. The circular driveway had a single car parked in it, letting me know that Stacy and her friend hadn't left yet. I sighed in relief and we parked behind her car. I texted her to let her know that we had gotten there and we all exited Austin's truck. Snow began to fall freely now. We put on our jackets, figuring that this place was not going to be heated inside. I gave Stacy a quick call. It appeared that she answered, but no one talked. Hey, we're here. Where are you? No answer. Hello? The line went dead. I looked at my phone and saw that the reception was all but existing. Oh, lovely. I thought. Any word from your girlfriend? Nick teased. I gave a playful nudge. Yeah, I wish. Yeah, I can't seem to get a hold of her. We will have to find her inside. Austin perked up. She brought a friend, right? Do you know if she's cute? I shook my head. Hard for me to tell. I guess I'll just have to meet her. We got to the entrance and Nick began to film. I gave a brief rundown of the history of what had happened here and what we thought was going on. Nick gave me a thumbs up letting me know that we got a good intro and we went inside. Inside the mansion, leaves and pine needles covered some of the marble floor. The air was especially cold inside as it was outside, but the wind had died down. Hey Stacy, we're here, I shouted, trying to notify her that we had arrived. For the briefest of moments, the thought of someone else being here had crossed my mind. If that was the case, then making my presence known seemed like a terrible idea, but I only saw her car outside. If anyone else was here, they then would have to be here by foot. 
Nick went off on his own and began filming sections of the estate, while shining a flashlight in each room. My priority at the moment was to find Stacy, so we could start hanging out. The mansion was huge. Depending on which section of the estate they were in, there was a good chance that they wouldn't be able to hear us. I first checked all the rooms on the main floor. My flashlight shined in each shadow, causing darkness to flee as I peered into every room. I could hear Nick and Austin talking, and I made sure not to leave out of earshot. After about 20 minutes or so, the main level was clear. As annoyed as I was, I was also impressed. Investigating a haunted house at night with your friends was a huge plus for me, so I couldn't stay mad. I backtracked to Austin and Nick by following their voices. I found the two standing near the base of the large stairway leading up to the second floor. Austin was slightly grasping his stomach and I knew what that meant. Austin had always had an irritable stomach. It was inevitable that he was going to have to go to the bathroom on this trip, but at least now he had somewhere to go. You okay, man? I said while patting his shoulder. Yeah. I'm just not sure where to go. Well, you're going to have to go outside into the woods. This place's plumbing doesn't work. Austin slapped the railing. Man, I hate going outside. Can one of you guys come with me? Nick and I shared a moment of amusement. Dude, we're not going to go out there and watch you poop in the woods. You'll be fine. Ugh, it's just that I hate being alone in the dark, Austin whimpered. Nick handed him his nice flashlight. Here, take my light. It's like that I'm there with you, but hurry back. We have more filming that we need to do. Austin took the light and went outside. Poor guy, I said as I looked at Nick. We were anxious to get to filming, but I began to wonder where Stacy and her friend had gone to. I checked my phone again and still no service. We stood in the cold, dark mansion waiting for Austin to return. When we heard a sound that sent shivers down our spines. A muffled scream could be heard beneath us. Nick and I looked at each other. Did you hear that? I asked Nick. Nick had hearing issues all throughout his childhood and wore hearing devices to help him hear better. Nick looked at me. I did. Right then, as if on cue, someone else screamed again. This time, we both knew it was coming from the basement. The way Nick and I were raised... Our first thought was that Stacy and her friend were not in any trouble, but rather, they had found the ghost that we were so anxious to find. Nick began recording and he followed me as we looked for the stairway leading to the basement. The dark mansion didn't make it easy. We eventually found the stairs. The old worn wood creaked and popped as Nick and I quickly descended. For a second, I thought that the stairs were going to give, but thankfully, they didn't. Hoping to find Stacy in the source of what caused such terror, we frantically began to shout as we reached the bottom. Stacy, where are you guys? I shouted. Only I had a flashlight as Nick had given his to Austin. I could hear movement deep within the basement, but no verbal response to my cry. I tried again. Stacy! I shined my light around, only finding old furniture covered with blankets and tarps filling the basement with eerie silhouettes and shadows. Much like upstairs, the basement was cold, but down here, it was especially damp. Dripping could be heard a good distance away, and an occasional puddle here and there. For the first time in a long time, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. It wasn't the screaming that scared me so much, or the creepy basement, but the fact that everything now was silent. Something was wrong, very wrong. If it wasn't for the fact that Stacy and her friend were here and parked outside, I would have thought that someone else was trying to lure us into the basement, or maybe they were. As much as I enjoyed horror and being afraid, my mind was telling me that I needed to leave. I could see how someone might be able to get lost down here. The basement was huge and with so many random things filled this rotten space. I looked at Nick, hoping he would be the voice of reason, telling me that we should leave, but he only stared at me. Where do you think they are? He whispered. His hushed tone scared me even more. I knew that he thought that perhaps there might be someone else down here other than Stacy and her friend. 
I shrugged my shoulders as I began to shiver from fear. I hesitated to talk or even move when a shuffling could be heard on the far side of the basement. I didn't think. I just reacted. I moved as quickly and as quietly as I could, hoping to find Stacy, or at the very least a familiar face. Before I could reach it, someone grabbed my leg from behind a piece of covered furniture and pulled me towards them. It was Bridget, one of Stacy's friends. I nearly jumped out of my skin and almost fell on top of her. Her eyes were wide and tears caused her makeup to run across her face, giving her a terrifying look. Her shirt was dirty and she sat on her knees in a crouched position, as if trying to remain concealed. He took her, she whispered. I knew that this couldn't have been a prank. A chill of terror shocked my spine as my body was now on high alert. Nick had the good sense to turn off the camera and crouch with us. What did she say? Nick said with a look of terror that matched Bridget. She said he took her, I repeated in a hushed tone. Who is he? I quietly asked. She shook her head. I don't know. We thought you guys were playing a prank on us and... He lured us down here. He took both of us down even further, but I managed to escape this far. I paused and looked at Nick. What do you mean he took you down even further? Genuinely confused by this. He took us down this tunnel. There were cages. He tried to put me in the cage, but I managed to escape and scratch him. Stacy fought him off enough for me to escape. You have to believe me. She was frantic clearly on the brink of a mental breakdown. We have to leave now while we still can. Please take me with you. Nick began helping her up, but I stayed still. Dude, you heard her. We have to leave. I shook my head softly. I'm not leaving Stacy here alone with some freak. I have to try to help. Nick and Bridget looked at me as if I was crazy, and I probably was. There's no way you can take him on. There's something wrong with him. The man that took Stacy, he's, he's not normal. He's some kind of man thing. Bridget was trying to plead her case, making the culprit seem some kind of monster, but I figured this was only due to shock. I'll manage, I reassured, picking up a rusted pipe that laid on the ground near a pile of trash. How about this? I'll get Bridget back to her car and I'll come back for you. How does that sound? Nick reassured. Nick was never this brave, but he was loyal. Loyalty was his fault. I knew that this terrified him much how I felt about this, but he knew that I wasn't going to give up on the one girl that I'd ever cared about. He wasn't perfect, but he knew when to be a good brother. I nodded. Bridget took out her phone and turned on the flashlight, and the two made their way out of the basement. I continued with the pipe in hand, looking for this tunnel. It took me longer than I thought, but sure enough, I found a hand-dug tunnel in the side of the basement. The tunnel had rough edges. Old frayed wires hung from the ceiling, but no longer worked. The tunnel had a slight slope heading downwards. I looked into the dark abyss while shining my light inside, hoping to see anything to help me get her back. A pit in my stomach began to grow as my mind was screaming at me to not do this but I was determined. Nothing was going to stop me. Not my mind, not some creepy guy that dug this tunnel. Nothing. I entered slowly, making sure I knew what was ahead of me. The tunnel was crudely made, but something about this made sense when Bridget referred to the man that took her as this thing. It was like some wild beast had burrowed its way down. The tunnel eventually turned, and a soft glow could be seen ahead. I tried to calm my breathing, but I felt like I couldn't get enough air. I could hear muffled sounds up ahead, and I knew I was about to come face to face with a real problem. My grip tightened on the pipe as I knew that I had to hit and hit hard, or else I would be the next victim. I turned the corner to see a candlelit opening and several cages inside. I could see a person in one of them. I silently shuffled over and saw that it was Stacy. Her hair was frayed and matted. Bruises covered her arm and small cuts could be seen on her face. She was staring in the opposite direction where the tunnel continued. I quickly walked over and put my finger to my lips, shushing her 
so as to not alarm whoever had done this. She saw me and her eyes widened. She then said something that almost stopped me in my tracks. Ryan, she whimpered, you have to get me out of here. He's going to eat me. I looked at the cage and saw that it was locked and placed by an old rusted combination lock. I jiggled it a few times and quickly realized what I had to do. Two quick but loud hits caused the lock to explode into pieces, and I unlocked Stacy from her cage. A sound deep within the other tunnel began to grow louder, as I knew I had alerted the attacker. She quickly exited the cage and we made a break for it. She was slow, and I could tell that she had been injured causing her pace to be that of a quick walk. Whatever was behind us was surely going to catch us. I made a quick glance back before turning the corner and saw the gruesomest of creatures to have ever walked the earth. Whatever it was, it wasn't human, that was for sure. The height of the beast was unreal, so much so that it had to crawl on all fours to make its way through the tunnel. I couldn't make out much details aside from that it wore no clothes and it was incredibly pale. I shoved Stacy along realizing that death was only a few paces behind us. We exited the tunnel and entered the basement. The beast's breath was right behind me. I turned to swing the pipe but was met with an incredible amount of force knocking me over and causing me to drop my flashlight. I fell into a pile of trash that made the landing hurt more than it should have. Thankfully, I still held on to my only weapon as I was about to fight to my death. I was disoriented. I tried to stand but quickly felt an icy grip grab my throat and squeeze the life out of me. I tried to swing the pipe but it just bounced off the thing as if I'd hit a solid tree. My head began to feel light as I knew that this was going to be the end. Two flashlights then appeared behind me, and I could feel the grip lighten slightly, as the creature was now distracted by someone else in the basement. The pressure then relieved entirely, as Nick swung a small stool across the beast's face. Before the creature could react, Austin followed up with a solid swing from the pipe I had dropped, knocking over the creature. Nick and Austin continued their assault until the creature's head was no more than a pile of blood and bone. After a few seconds, I finally caught my breath. My neck was still on fire and I had to check to make sure I wasn't bleeding. The three of us stood over the beast's corpse. None of us had ever seen anything like this before. I thanked them, but they just stared at this horrific marvel that had no place in our world. Stacy then came up behind us. We need to leave. This isn't the thing that took me. It's still down there. The four of us sprinted out of the basement and out of the mansion. Naturally, we called the police, but the whole incident is another story. Since then, I'm no longer a fan of horror. It had left its mark on me in ways that I'll never be able to get over. Stacy and I stopped talking. We'd only remind each other of the nightmare that we'd had to go through. As for the thing in the basement... We haven't heard back from the police about whatever that thing was. But the thing that worried me the most about all this messed up stuff is that if the thing that attacked me wasn't the same thing that took Stacy, then what took Stacy? The House in the Cornfield the snowy hill was filled with children and parents alike, all sledding blissfully, utilizing the first snow day of the year. Jacob had never experienced snow like this before, at least in any way as memorable as this. Jacob had moved from South Carolina. Quite the cultural difference, sure, but still being in middle school, he wasn't exactly partial to the South. The snow was fresh and still falling at a considerable rate that you could expect the next couple of days off from school. It was an early snowfall, at least for Davis County. The clear hill was quite dense with all ages of people enjoying the first snowfall, as if snow itself rendered everyone the same age and maturity. It didn't take long for Jacob to find his handful of friends he had made since the beginning of the school year. Since Jacob's parents were separated and his mother would be working all day, he knew that he had virtually no curfew. After spending a good portion of the day, the hill 
slowly diminished of people. The bareness of the hill made the once fun and exciting place to be more somber and isolating. The woods that surrounded both sides seemed to become darker. Despite Jacob being with his friends, he now became aware of the time, not that he needed to get back, but that the shadows of the woods began to creep across the hill. The sun was still up, and would be for the next couple of hours, but Jacob and his friends quickly realized that they were the last ones on the hill. Stories of kidnappers and gruesome serial killers that frequented the dark woods surrounding them caused their snow day to become short. If anything were to happen to these boys, no one would know about it for quite some time. It's getting kind of late. I'm soaking wet, Ethan said while glancing around the empty hill. Same time tomorrow? Assuming that school is still canceled. Jacob nodded his head. He was glad someone said something since he didn't want to be the first to end such a great time. The small group of boys did one last run before all meeting up at the bottom of the hill and going their separate ways. Ethan and his brother Jason went their separate ways from the rest of the boys, since they lived on the other side of town. Jacob, Gary, and Trevor began the cold walk alongside the woods, which bordered some kind of abandoned cornfield of some kind. After five minutes of walking, Trevor pitched the idea that there was a shortcut in the cornfield that would take about 15 minutes off their walk back to the main road. Jacob had seen the cornfield when he was walking to the hill earlier that day. The brown and black stalks of corn stood at a height that made visibility quite difficult especially at their preteen sizes. But thankfully, the field was clearly not taken care of. The once perfect field of road corn was now slowly losing the crop that once grew here. Getting lost in the field was possible, but not likely. Trevor and Gary began pushing their way through the dying crop when they looked back to see Jacob. He was clearly not comfortable with the idea. Are we allowed to go in the cornfield? Doesn't someone own this? Gary began to chuckle. Does it look like anyone owns it? It looks terrible. Jacob was unconvinced. What if we get lost in there? Then we'll really be in trouble. Trevor piped in. We won't get lost. I've done this before. There's a path in here somewhere that leads you to the other side by the road. You don't have to come, but you will have to walk back by yourself. Up to you. The two boys continued walking slowly, out of view of Jacob. The woods behind him were menacing, especially so since he was slowly becoming more alone by the second. The irrational thoughts would quickly triumph over reason as Jacob quickly found himself chasing after his friends in the cornfield. Thankfully, he didn't have to go too far to find them. Worst case scenario, he could simply follow the footprints in the snow to find them, but he didn't have to. The young boys chuckled through their wet scarves as they knew Jacob was too afraid to be alone. The three continued together trudging through the snow and toppled corn stalks that filled the field. About halfway through the field, a small clearing emerged, revealing to the surprise of all the young boys an old and decrepit two-story home, quietly gathering snow. Whoa, this wasn't here before, Trevor mumbled. Trevor was telling the truth when he had said he had crossed the field many times, but in none of his instances of taking the shortcut, had he ever come across the home? Gary and Jacob were silent. Taking in the hideous form that neglect inflicted upon the exterior wood of the house, the clearing wasn't terribly large, just enough to imprison the strange structure within it. It was a home for sure, but there was no road or path leading to this bizarre destination, and the building itself emitted no light, only darkness. Thick clouds of snow began to swell in the sky, shading the dimming sun even more so. The three boys silently agreed that this might have been something fun to investigate perhaps with an older brother or on a warm summer day, but right now, this place was dreadful. A place that surely must have held terrors and pain, a serial killer's hideout, no doubt. None of the boys even suggested entering. The excuse of being late in the day or being too cold didn't even have to arise as they all walked past the house. They continued into the field, seeing how that for once, the idea of them no longer being alone began to fester in their young minds. They had a couple of hours of daylight left, so panic didn't initially find them, 
when they were not able to find the other side of the field. The stalks were too tall, shrouding any possibility of peering over to find a hint out of this unintended maze. Rather than fear or anxiety, frustration kept the boys company as they wandered aimlessly in the cornfield. The shortcut, which should have taken maybe 10 minutes in its entirety, was now almost an hour in, effectively removing this path from the title of being a shortcut. Thankfully, the boys were smart, at least when it came to problem solving. I suppose they weren't that smart seeing how they put themselves in this situation, but nonetheless, they realized that all they had to do was backtrack by following their snow prints, and they would have found the way that they came into the field. But time and weather were against them. Snow continued to fall, slowly filling the shoe prints that would guide them out of there. The boys stopped guessing their way back and turned back. The snow prints weren't easy to follow. The uneven ground and the fallen stalks of corn made tracking their path not the easiest, but definitely possible. A brisk 15 minutes passed and the boys found themselves back at the house. Following their footprints and trying to hurry had greatly minimized the time needed. But as fate would have it, the young boys were not able to find their initial trail leading to the house. Again, there was no rush in regards to daylight, but the idea that they were lost began to slowly dawn on them, causing them to resort to an unpleasant reality. All they needed to know was which direction they needed to take to get them out the fastest. If they could only just simply glance over the stalks of corn, they would know in a matter of seconds. But the only way for them to do that was if they entered the house of horrors, if you will, go to the second story and glance out the window. Now this was obviously easier said than done. The thought of someone still living inside seemed unlikely, due purely to the house's condition. But that didn't mean a hobo or some desperate animal didn't take this structure as its new home. The three considered drawing straws, but that idea was pointless seeing how whoever was going to go inside would be too scared to do so alone. The boys realized that if they wanted to get out of this field, then they would all need to go inside to do so. The front of the house looked empty. The bottom level windows had been boarded and what remained of the front door appeared to be chained. A sigh of relief came across the boys, as they could say with a probability that no one was inside. But this did make their plan more difficult seeing how they needed a way in. The boys quickly circled the house. Gary, who was on the back side, shouted, Guys, come here. I think I have something. Jacob and Trevor quickly sprinted and saw Gary trying to lift a storm cellar door, but was struggling with the weight. A heavy chunk of ice and snow made the door three times as heavy. With the help of the other boys, they were able to open the door and peer inside. A dark set of stairs led them into a dark basement. The three looked at each other as they slowly went inside. Thankfully, the stairs didn't go too deep, but the sun was on the wrong side of the house to properly illuminate the basement fully. Inside the basement was a treasure trove of junk and other miscellaneous items that served no real purpose but to young boys. This was a jackpot. Old farming equipment laid on the floor and sides of the walls while a particular item laid in a cleared area in front of a strange metal door. Gary and Trevor were preoccupied with picking out what they wanted to take, that they didn't notice Jacob walking over to the metal door. The metal door looked as if it didn't belong in the house. If anything, it looked like a bank vault. But that's not what caught Jacob's attention. Laying in front of the door, as if it was watching it, was a skull. Not any ordinary skull, but one with twisted and dark bone. It didn't appear to be human, at least to Jacob, but surely this was some kind of creature he was unfamiliar with. He was drawn to it mainly out of morbid curiosity. He went to pick up the item and once he touched it, his vision went black. A disembodied demon voice spoke to him. A wretched soul touches the totem. His vision was now filled with horrors and pain, people screaming from torture and violence. A gathering in the woods of strange people wearing masks, chanting and sacrificing poor victims to a strange and dark god of the woods. A vision of a dark entity looking upon his soul with no barrier of concealment. You are now cursed with the totem. 
What felt like a thousand years of torment and agony ended up being only a few moments as Jacob was brought back to reality. Neither Gary nor Trevor had realized what had happened. They were too busy scavenging through garbage until Jacob came to and began to vomit violently. Sludge of black filth escaped his body, causing the other two boys to forget what they were doing and give attention to Jacob, who was now on his hands and knees dry heaving what little vomit remained. You okay, bro? Trevor said worriedly. No, I'm not. Something's not right. Before Jacob explained what had happened, Gary saw the metal door ahead of them. Whoa, this looks like a safe door or something. There's probably some treasure behind it. Jacob stood to his feet. Don't touch the door. He was exhausted. He was no longer subjected to the cold of the snow, but was now sweating from every pore. Dude, what are you holding? The thing looked scary. Jacob looked down to see he was holding the totem skull by its antler. Before he could get a word out, a loud slam came from the other side of the door and a scream. The scream shook the boys except for Jacob, who was still coming to terms with what he had just experienced. The door shook its frame as rapid banging began to twist and mangle its shape. Something strong was behind it. The boys made their way out of the basement, up the stairs, and up to the second floor. Panic controlled their bodies, but they still remembered to look over the cornfield to find their way out. After a quick glance, the three then saw the direction they needed to go and began to lift the old window. Whatever was behind the door in the basement had gotten out. A loud slam of the metal door landing flat on the concrete floor told the boys they only had a couple of seconds before whatever it was that was being detained had gotten out. The boys got the old window to budge, but not enough. Thinking quickly on his feet, Gary grabbed a drawer from a fallen dresser that was sitting in the room and threw it out the window, shattering the glass and the frame that held it together. The thing was now out of the basement and on the main floor. None of the boys had time to think about jumping out the window, but just did it. The snow and the stalks of corn provided little cushion to their fall, but the adrenaline in their bodies made up for the damages. They sprinted into the cornfield. After 10 minutes, they finally escaped and made it to the other side. Neither of them were sure what was in the basement, nor if it followed them out, but they didn't wait around to find out. It wasn't until Jacob had a moment to breathe did he realize he was still holding on to the totem. He thought he left the cursed item in the basement with whatever hell-like creature was in there, but he was still grasping it tightly. The boys continued to run down the street to a more populated part of the town. From there, they began to feel safe. The boys took a moment to recall what had happened, and they all agreed on what they experienced. It was clearly that they had nearly escaped some terrible fate. They didn't get a good look at whatever it was, but that didn't mean it didn't see them. Gary and Trevor began walking towards their street, and Jacob went his own way home. Vomit on his winter jacket had covered the front of his clothes, and began to harden from the cold. The sun which the boys had taken advantage of had now began to set. The traumatic experience made it so that Jacob never wanted to see this totem again, but any thought he had of throwing it away into the woods would cause a voice to speak in his head. You cannot relieve yourself of such a fate. You are bound to the totem. Jacob continued his way home and found his mother was still at work. Unsure of what to do with the totem, Jacob placed it under his bed and took a shower. Jacob woke up the next morning to his alarm clock. His last memory was him taking a shower, but he didn't remember leaving. Not only that, but he didn't remember having dinner or even going to bed. But the strange thing about all this was that he did remember his dream from last night. Normally, Jacob, for the life of him, could not remember his dreams. But from the night prior was totally different. He dreamt he had walked home with Gary and Trevor, except they didn't make it home. Something had grabbed them, dragged the two back into the cornfield and into the basement of the house. Jacob was covered in sweat as he rubbed his face. He glanced around the room to see if the totem was there or even real, but thankfully, he was not able to find it. It was five or so in the morning. His mother should have been home, but was probably still asleep. Jacob went to check the news on the TV to see if school was still canceled. 
but the newscaster was talking about sports from over the weekend. Jacob was about to make himself a bowl of cereal, but realized he wasn't hungry. Not only that, but thinking about eating anything other than meat made him nauseous. About an hour later, around six or so, the news finally covered the school districts that were closed. Davis County was open. Dang, this was frustrating, as no kid wants to go to school on a perfectly good snow day. But Jacob wasn't opposed to getting some social interaction. The thought of him going back to the hill or even near that cornfield was too much. It would cause him to panic and get anxious, unlike anything he had ever felt before. His mother entered the living room, rubbing the sleep out of her eyes. You have school today, bud? Jacob nodded. Aw, uh, that's too bad. Give me a minute and I'll give you a ride. Jacob was quiet the entire morning. Normally, he would interact with most kids or would answer the teacher's questions, but he was filled with anger and malice. It was around third period when something strange occurred. Two policemen entered the classroom with Principal Roberts and asked to speak to Jacob. Jacob shot up out of his desk and walked over to the three men. He knew it must have been about entering that home and probably stealing things that didn't belong to them. The four of them walked to the principal's office and Jacob was about to confess when the officers asked about Gary and Trevor. Jacob was stunned, but was also silent. Apparently, neither boy made it home yesterday. Jacob saw the officer's badge with the name Wilkins on it. Now the parents tell us that you're good friends with both the boys. I'm guess that you were with them sledding on that hill like every other child. Did anything strange happen? Jacob was afraid. Jacob shook his head and was about to lie when he blurted out, We went into the cornfield and something chased us out of there. Both officers were stunned and began writing down on their notepads. Surprisingly, neither officer was angry, but rather understanding and supportive. Okay, well, thank you for your honesty. Tell us what happened. Jacob began to tell the officers what had happened, but when he mentioned the house, both officers had a look of confusion. Wait, there's a house in that cornfield? You sure? It wasn't a shed or anything? No, it was a house. We had to go inside to see which direction we needed to go to get out of that field. The officers continued riding. Are we talking about the same sledding hill? The one on the other side of town? I'm not sure, said Jacob. I'm new here. I don't know of any other hill in town. Well, the reason we ask is that that specific cornfield had been abandoned since the 80s. There was a farm there, but it burned down. Now the reason we're worried is because the officer stopped. You know what? Forget it. Thanks for your honesty. You may go. Jacob was not able to focus the rest of the day. Both his friends were missing and he had a sickening feeling that he had something to do with it. However, he was thankful. The voices in his head and the totem were no longer around. The day dragged on and school eventually let out. On the way home, he couldn't stop thinking about what the officer was trying to say before he had stopped himself. What was he going to say? The bus arrived on his street and he got off. His body was sore from yesterday, but the cold air took his mind off of it. Jacob reached the driveway to his house when he had noticed the front door to his house it was open. His mother's car was not in the driveway, so this concerned him. Jacob had no cell phone, so calling the police would require him to go to a neighbor's house or to go inside. With how everything was recently, with not only this encounter from yesterday, but his friends going missing, he decided to ask his neighbors. Thankfully, Mrs. Wilson was home. Jacob called the police and told them that someone had broken into his house. Surprisingly enough, the same two officers from the school happened to arrive at his house. Jacob, right? Officer Wilkins said. We checked out that cornfield earlier today. Couldn't find anything. Jacob was silent. So, what's going on here? Someone broke in? Jacob nodded. Well, that was smart of you to call us rather than entering your own home. Can't be too careful. Hang tight while we go inside. Both officers drew their weapons and entered the home. Jacob waited outside by their cruiser, unsure of who or what they would find. To his surprise, the officers were not quick. In fact, other officers arrived on the scene before he saw those two again. 
Eventually, Jacob's mother caught wind that the police were at her house and left work early. The original officers eventually came out some time later and requested both the mother and Jacob come with them down to the station for questioning. Jacob's mother was not pleased by this. Why do you need us to go to the station? What's going on here? The officers tried to calm her down, but to no avail. Something happened inside, and you guys are no longer safe here. We need you to come back to the station, and from there we can brief you on what's going on. Jacob and his mother finally agreed, and drove down to the station with the officers. It was dark out, roughly 8 o'clock. The snow began to pick up again. Once inside the station, police finally shared what they had found inside. Firstly, the house itself was destroyed as if someone purposely vandalized the house, but also in a way that someone was looking for something. But that wasn't the concerning part. In Jacob's room, the police found a decapitated deer and blood smeared all over the room. Etched into the deer were three words, return the totem. No one knew what it meant except for Jacob. His eyes went wide as fear struck him, paralyzed. What does this mean, Jacob? His mother cried. I... I saw something yesterday. I didn't think it had value, but I might have found something that was evil. The officers began writing again, and the mother stared at him with a look of shock. What are you talking about? I thought you went sledding yesterday. We were, but afterwards we found a house in the cornfield. Inside were all these strange items, and I touched something I shouldn't have. But I haven't seen it since yesterday. I don't know where it is now. Before anyone could say anything, Officer Wilkins spoke up. I think we found it at the scene. Is this what they were after? Officer Wilkins bent down and picked up a box with evidence tape on it. Inside was a skull totem. The item alone made Jacob's worried mother burst into tears. What have you gotten yourself into? She cried. The other officers removed the mother from the room and Jacob and Wilkins remained. We think that if you return this item to the house in that cornfield, whoever had kidnapped your friends will release them. Now we can't be sure that's what we have to do, but would you at least be willing to show us where this house is? Jacob felt sick. The idea of going anywhere near that cornfield riddled his body full of anxiety. But he thought about his friends, how scared they must have been, how cold and hungry they were. That is, if they were still alive. I'll do it. I'll show you where it is on one condition. If I show you that house, you'll have to help me put back the totem and fight whatever took my friends. Officer Wilkins agreed. Wilkins, his partner, Officer Taylor, and Jacob drove from the station back to the hill. It was much later now. The moon provided some light, but clouds were thick. Jacob sat in the back of the cruiser with the box holding the totem. He could almost hear it speaking to him. Open the box. Take me out. I can make you immortal. The whisperings were getting to him, but luckily they finally arrived to the field. The field was dark. Both officers put on protective gear and mounted flashlights on their rifles, but they didn't call him back up. Taking a young boy to a potential kidnapper's house in the middle of nowhere was completely against regulation, but they were desperate at this point. This was a time-sensitive situation. If they were lucky, they would be able to save the other two boys and take down the sick freak that would have for sure killed them. Jacob exited the cruiser holding the box. His breath warmed his face as the bitter night air howled in the distance. Jacob was afraid. Even though he had two highly trained officers with him, he still feared for his safety and that of his friends. All right, kid, you're on point. Lead us to this freak's house and we'll save your friends. Jacob led the officers into the field. The field and the corn stalks were bigger than he remembered. The dark night definitely didn't help. As the three pushed their way through, both officers made sure to break as many stalks as they could, clearing a path out for them to get out quickly if needed. Jacob began to shiver, not from the cold air, but that he knew he was going to slowly reach the place he swore he'd never go to again. From behind, Officer Taylor exclaimed, Oh my gosh, there it is. He shined his light up ahead, and sure enough, the phantom house appeared in the field. 
This can't be. We searched this field for hours today. This was not here before. Something's wrong. Officer Taylor began to panic. There's something off about this. This is more than just a house. This is something much worse. I can feel it. Jacob and Wilkins looked back, seeing how Officer Taylor was now having a panic attack. I can't do this. This place will kill us, all of us. Wilkins pulled him aside. What are you doing? You and I have been through way worse. We need to get it together. The kid's fine, and he was the one before without any weapons. You need to push through for me. Do it for the kids that are inside. But Taylor just froze, completely petrified, as if his mind knew of the evil that lurked within. After a few minutes, Wilkins and Jacob continued on. Well, it looks like it's just you and me, kid. Let's go find your friends. Jacob took him over to the storm cellar door that he and his friends had found the other day. The door was still open. Okay, I'm going to lead the way and you stay behind me. Don't say or do anything that will give away our position. Jacob nodded. The two entered slowly, as if time itself slowed. The light on the rifle pierced into the darkness, illuminating the basement. The box holding the totem began to vibrate. We're getting close, Jacob whispered. A search of the basement revealed to the officer and Jacob that there was indeed something down there, but not at the moment. The basement was clear, but a soft crying could be heard upstairs. They're upstairs, Wilkins whispered as he found the stairs leading up and led the way. The cry became louder the higher they went up. It sounded as if at least one of the boys was still alive, but Jacob was unsure which of his friends it was. The box vibrated more, as if a rabid animal was trying to escape from within. The box is shaking on its own. I'm not doing this, Jacob assured we need to get this guy in now. You stay on the main floor and I'll take care of him. Wilkins then rushed up the stairs and barged into one of the rooms on the second floor. Stop, please, hands up, Wilkins shouted. Multiple screams could be heard. His friends were alive. Jacob looked up the stairs intently, trying to see what was going on, but it was too dark. Gunshots could be heard in a loud bang. He's killing him, the box whispered. You can still save him. Take me to the beast. Jacob was no longer in control of his body. His thoughts were consumed by hunger and pain. He knew what was up there, what was waiting for him in the darkness. His instincts were telling him to run, drop the box and run as fast as you can, but he was now being commanded by the totem. Jacob walked up the stairs slowly, screaming and banging continued. He ascended the stairs and saw the light shine from the next room as Wilkins' gun laid on the floor. Jacob entered the room to see a pale, skinny man standing over Wilkins. The man had blood on his mouth and hands as Wilkins laid lifeless on the ground. The box shook so much that Jacob dropped it, and the totem rolled on the floor. The creature stopped and looked at Jacob. This man was tall. His body hardly looked human. He looked as if people evolved to be killing machines. He can't be killed! screamed Gary. Jacob then felt immense pain shoot throughout his body. The man went to pick up the twisted skull totem, but when he did, it burned him. He dropped it and Jacob fell to the ground. Visions began to fill his mind as his two friends looked on in horror. Jacob's limbs began to grow and snap, twisting and elongating much like the man that took the boys. After a few painful seconds, Jacob looked almost identical to the demon man that stood before them. Officer Wilkins began to come too, seeing that there were now two beasts in the room. He went to reach for his rifle, but the boys told him to stop. Jacob then stood, towering over the much smaller window. The two beasts began to fight as the boys grabbed the officer and left the room. Screams from both could be heard as they left the house and found the path that Wilkins and Taylor made for them to escape. The three of them continued to hear screams until it was abruptly stopped. None of them waited to see who had won the battle of the beasts. Siren lights could be seen through the stalks as Wilkins realized Taylor had called him back up. Dozens of cruisers sat outside the field, with men ready to enter. But this would be pointless, as Officer Wilkins knew that without Jacob, they would never find that house. <laughs>